students, we are here to discuss the emergence of political institutions in the earliest phase of Indian history as gleaned from the Vedic literature. For this discussion, I have with me on my right Chiran Tonidash, who is presently teaching in St. Xavier's College, Calcutta, and Niba Buri Banerjee, who is also teaching in Netaji Nagar College, Calcutta. On my left, I have Amitra Sri Bhattacharya, who is an undergraduate student from the Department of History, Jadavpur University. Now, the Vedic sources allude to a number of political formations and structures which would otherwise have remained shrouded in the mystery of the past. These references throw light on the earliest phases of institutionalization of a framework of polity which would provide the ground for state formation in the early historic period of India. Ma'am, is there any possibility of correlation between the archaeological cultures and the Vedic society? Yes, it is very interesting to note that the descriptions that we have from the Vedic literature about the Vedic society matches temporally and spatially with the zone in which the archaeologically designated calculatic culture associated with the OCP and later on the archaeologically designated culture of PGW associated with the Iron Age had evolved. Now, so far as space correlations and the settlement formations are concerned, there can be some kind of connectivity, but it is very difficult to ascertain with any degree of certainty the, that, that actually the Vedic culture could be identified with these archaeological complexes. Moreover, to glean something about political life from archaeological evidence is extremely difficult. Therefore, for this particular discussion, we are mainly relying on the literary evidence from the Vedic literature. Ma'am, can we specify any geographical zone that may be identified with the early Vedic society? Yes, uh, in fact, the Vedic literature contains discussions, descriptions about the river valleys, which shows that probably these people in the very early days had settled down or, or moved about in a region uh, in the Panch Kor and Khorban river valleys south of the Hindu Kush mountains and spread over to the upper Ganga valley up to the western Uttar Pradesh. And later on, they moved off about into the Middle Ganga Valley also. Ma'am, and what kind of indication do we get uh, of the power and leadership in early Vedic times? You see, the early Vedic people were mainly pastoral and nomadic. And they were moving about in bands of uh, tribes along with their cattle, which formed their mainstay for the economy. Now, uh, the, these bands were denoted as goshti because of the joint jointly held cattle wealth okay and the most common confrontations that we find are related to cattle raids and the popular image emerges about a hero who would be leading in these cattle raids and the term that is used is gojit and also we hear of the terms such as gopa gopati and gomat now whereas gopa is associated with the i mean kind of accumulation of cattle wealth gopati means a leader among the people okay so it is from the term and the concept of leadership within these bands of koshti and the position of the gopati that later on the concepts of chiefdom or kingship would evolve use of horse as a domesticated animal a hallmark to vedic culture uh, crucial to swift and successful raids was soon absorbed into the paradigm of power and it uh, soon led to the conceptualization of regal rituals. Absolutely. For example, we have the Ashwamedha sacrifice, right. for example. Ma'am, was there any indication of warfare in the early days? Yes. In fact, from the very early days in the Rig Veda, we find references to raids, confrontations, battles between the Vedic tribes who were generally denoted by the term Jana. Uh, can you enlarge upon it? The Vedic Jana was most popular socio-political unit, later indicating probably whole tribes settled in certain areas. A number of references show that there were early tribes like Purus, Trisus and Bharatas. The Rig Veda alludes to the famous Dasaragya battle yes. uh, fought by 10 tribes and the tribal confederacy of the Bharatas. Um, uh, thus the tribal clans and leaderships were reigning during the early Vedic 
Vedic times and these inter-tribal confrontations and battles were quite common during those days. I think um, these, you know, um, uh, inter-tribal confrontation, rivalries and warfares were also common between the Vedic tribes and the Dasa or Dasyu dynasties. For example, we do have references of uh, the leading campaign uh, of Bharatas against the uh, tribal chief Sambara. Yeah. In fact, uh, on the one hand, we have these, the Dasi and Dasyu, from all the references that we get in the Rig Veda, it seems that these terms actually denoted some tribes or group of people who were of non-Vedic origin. And they might have drawn their roots from the pre-Vedic times also. Okay. Uh, and uh, side by side with these battles and confrontations, we have indications that there were Janas or popular bodies of people in a tribal formation. On the other hand, we also hear of dynasties with kings in, in a dynastic lineage following from each other. For example, we have the Ikshvaku dynasty, the Vedic dynasty of Ikshvakus, uh, and we also hear of the Ikshvaku king Purukutsa, who is followed by his famous son Trasadasu. So, these are the certain formations from which we have later on the derivation of some kind of a chiefdom leading to monarchy. Ma'am, can you tell us about the formation of the social units in the early Vedic phase? You see, the, the most common term that we get is Jana, which is the biggest social unit. It denoted a tribe. And then we have the Visa, who were actually the clans within a Jana. And basically, uh, the Jana unit was an egalitarian structure. But later on, we, we shall find that this Jana was getting bifurcated, the Visa among the uh, Jana was getting bifurcated into two tiers, hierarchical tiers. And we have the rise of the Rajanya group from among the Visa. On the other hand, we also have another, if you look down from the below, this is the biggest unit, Jana, and then the Visa. And if you look at the downwards uh, unit, then we find that it is the Kula, which was a family. A family tree order, in fact, consisting of the parental and the filial generations. Now, this kula forms at the lowest base of the society. We do hear of the term of kulapa only once in the Rig Veda, although later on we find that this term will become more common. It seems that well, it is only in the later days that a patriarchal authority in, within the social structure was emerging. On the other hand, we shall have the Janasyapati, that the chief leadership of a chief was emerging at the top of the society. Ma'am, as you are talking about the political and social units, I would like to know, was there something of an idea of origin of state in the Vedic literature? Yeah, uh, we really don't have much of it in the early Vedic phase, but of course in the two uh, texts of the later Vedic times, one in Aitariya Brahmana and the other is Chatapatha Brahmana, we have uh, certain allusions to legendary formations. Uh, which probably relates to some kind of a concept of a state formation. It seems that in the Aitareya Brahmana, there is a theory, uh, almost something of a theory uh, coming near to the social contract theory, where we find that the people are actually consenting among themselves to select one from among themselves as their own leader. So that would be something approaching a social contract idea. Whereas in the Satapatha Brahmana, we have the concept of divine right monarchy emerging with the divine intervention on, on behalf of the people. So it is a kind of a nomination of a person by the divinity as a king as to lead the people. So we have both these kind of ideas on the one hand, the people's choice and on the other, the, the God's nomination. Ma'am, what evidence do we find regarding the popular political institutions in the early Vedic literature? One of the most popular political institutions would be the Gana, which has been referred to in the Rig Vedic literature. Uh, we find that this Vedic Gana was actually some kind of an egalitarian tribal assembly, not formulated of any specific tribe, but it is a general assembly, which had certain military, religious and uh, political uh, collective activities. Okay. Uh, but uh, there have been ver various ideas thrown about by scholars regarding the concept of Gana and uh, many scholars believe that it had some kind of a republican nature in it. This is because in the later day, uh, in the post Vedic times, we have the emergence of uh, the Gana constitutions in the uh, upper Ganga and the middle Ganga valleys. 
but otherwise we now for for the time being in the early vedic context we can only think in terms of a a kind of an association where the people assembled in in an egalitarian formation and operating for different purposes okay and the leader of the gana at one place is described as ganasya raja mm. and uh, is generally called ganapati yeah. i think ma'am the appellation of rajan to ganapati may um, suggest that uh, the later position transformed himself into that of tribal chief or king yes yes uh we also have janasya pati janasya rajam and then we have ganasya pati so gana may might have been a formation a, a kind of a formation from which there was also some kind of leadership emerging apart from the gana the more popular forms of political bodies which actually operated in the vedic society were the sabha the samiti and the parishad now nibapuri can you enlarge something about the sabha Yes, the Vedic term sabha itself denoted both the people in conclave and the hall, which was the venue of their meeting. A Rig Vedic reference indicates that uh, in earlier days the sabha was a kind of social assembly serving also as gambling hall. Yes. Uh, there was a sabha parlor, the guardian of the assembly hall. Right. Right. And uh, one uh, late Rig Vedic source speaks of women uh, as sabha bati, meaning that she was uh, worthy of going to attend the sabha, right. and the, yes. which also indicates that uh, women uh, members. had attended these bodies yes that is very important actually yeah and ma'am i would like to add something more that the presence of the king in the sabha is also referred in the early portions of the rigveda yes. but initially he was just a member among many uh however he took the decisions and advices of the sabha to be of supreme importance mm -hmm. and possibly could not do without the support of its members yeah but what happened with gradual with gradually with time with social inequalities developing and more and more accumulation of wealth we find that the nature of the sabha was also transforming and uh, for example even in the rigveda there are references to the maghavans the term denoting rich persons so owning cattle and horses and chariots so these these maghavans and the brahmans were becoming the members of the sabha and getting membership in a sabha was also becoming an exclusive right so to say this also reference is available in the atharvaveda and the rigveda so it seems that in the later day uh, the king in the sabha along with this rich and aristocratic membership uh, formed into some kind of an exclusive assembly okay and they became an advisory body to the king later on maybe towards the end of the vedic period itself Okay, Amita Sri, would you like to know something about the Samiti from them? Yes, ma'am. Yes, can you? Uh, ma'am, according to Ludwig, Samiti was a more comprehensive body, including not only common people but also the Brahmanas as the rich patrons. Mm. And a portion of Atharva Veda shows that even women participated in the affairs right. of the uh, Samiti. And the same Atharva Veda also shows that this uh, Samiti was the body which was responsible for the election of the king. Right, right you are. And uh, the Rig Veda announced that. king had to attain the samiti in order to remain true to his position right mm -hmm. um, it yes. may have been just like a social assembly during the earlier days and assumed political status during the um, later vedic period compared to sabha the samiti uh, was more popular uh, for body of uh, representations but both the bodies had evidently exercised some political role and i think uh, they acted as a constraint right. on the power of yes. the nascent kingship right, right. ma'am can you throw some light on the nature of the vidatha you see vidatha was one of the popular institutions that we find referred frequently in the rigveda 
but later on I think its importance got diminished because in the Atharva Veda we do not have that much of a reference. Uh, the meaning of the term Vidatha had been very puzzling and uh, many scholars have thrown about different ideas about its connotation. But I think the most plausible one is that offered by Oldenburg who suggested that the word Vidatha actually derived from the root Vidha which actually associated the ideas of disposition, distribution and ordinance. Now it seems that the Vidatha was actually a folk body and, and a very old folk body from which later on the Sabha, the Samiti, the Parishad, the Sena had emerged. And ma'am, apart from its uh, political role, um, it has uh, it had its military character, uh, which we can uh, you know uh, find from its association with Indra and other warlords. Lastly, ma'am, the Vidata uh, undoubtedly provided uh, a common ground to the yes. whole uh, um, uh, folk uh, mm. for the worship of their gods, mm -hmm. which can be evident from the co commentary of Shayana. Yeah. Uh, another meaning of the Vidata is related to distribution. Mm -hmm. Now Agni is described as the liberal distributor of the produce in the Vidata and we can't forget that uh, the distribution of produce was one of the important functions of the primitive assemblies. And uh, this Vidata is often found to be associated with women. Right. A portion of Atava Veda shows that it is uh, associated with women. Actually these women were sent to the Vidata to sp speak for their families. And this body, this Vidata is rarely mentioned in the later Vedic literature. Yeah. The other uh, uh, popular body which we hear of in the uh, both in the early Vedic and the later Vedic phase is the Parishad. Uh, the terms, the descriptions that we find regarding Parishad would denote that it was some kind of a close band of associates, specially related with the uh, warrior community. Because every time that we hear of the Parishad, it is in association with, with uh, either divinities who were warrior-like or with the warrior bands. But later on uh, in the famous passage of Shatapatha Brahmana, we have an allusion to the Parishad of the Panchalas, where it is exclusively meant to be a clan organization led by the king okay, uh, or the chief of the clan. We find that with the changes in economic life, with the adoption of agriculture and sedentarism, there were uh, social inequalities which was reflected in the Varna formation for example towards the end of the Rig Vedic phase and also uh, it was correlated with the political inequalities and the rise of hierarchy within the political structure. Now both these spheres therefore would have these the rise of the Brahma in the religious sphere and the rise of the Kshatra in the political sphere. The Brahma stands for the religious leadership and the Kshatra stands for the political leadership. Uh, and the base was uh, provided by the Vish who were the common people. These are the basic producers and their produce was being extorted by the ruling community and that was distributed to the Brahmanical community as Dana and Dakshina. Now uh, it is also interesting to note that there was a close nexus between the Brahma and the Kshatra because the Brahma was responsible for ritually legitimizing the rule uh, of these uh, chiefs and the kings. On the other hand, the, these rulers would actually uh, uh, apportion part of their uh, collections from the Vaishya uh, as Dana and Dakshina to the priestly classes. So this close nexus had actually given a force which was leading towards concentration of political authority. And the description of the Rajan uh, or the warrior class even in the later Vedic uh, literature depicts them as sporting with bow and arrow, drinking wine, playing dice, running chariot races etc and generally being the epitome of a hero. Yes. Now in the earlier times the winner of a chariot race or a dice is given precedence as the leader but later references show that the concept of leadership underwent several changes with time. Right. Right. Ma'am, what kind of clue do we get about how kingship and kingdom emerged? You see, uh, we have the term Rashtra being used in the seventh mandala of the Rig Veda and that term is actually associated with the orbit, the concept of the orbit of the king's authority. 
although in this very early days we cannot really understand that term in the in the meaning that it has nowadays uh, it it probably was an abstract concept uh, and uh, there was uh, the the sense of territoriality to rashtra was probably not attached at this time but yet the the authority of the king over a demographic whole might have been indicated because we also hear of uh, the the allusion to the wish in association with the rashtra so the visha was identified as the rashtra probably therefore it meant that the king had authority of the wish and it is also interesting that the term vishpati becomes an epithet of the king so we have the janasya raja and we also discussed about the ganasya raja who is evolving as the vishpati and then again we also hear of the terms of rashtrapati and rashtraprit now rashtrapati on the one hand actually signifies the king's authority or king's uh, hierarchical rule over the rashtra on the other hand the term rashtraprit means refers to his duty towards the rashtra Okay. okay and ma'am there is some controversy over the issue of king selection and the yes. role of the king makers which can be attested from both the rigvedic sources and later vedic sources right yes however in the early days the support of the entire clan was necessary as uh, attested in the rigveda uh, the king had to be desired by all that was true even for the atharva vedic days but the contemporary satabatha brahman leans more in favor of a powerful kingship attempting to emerge with the active support of the courtiers or the rajkritas and the priestly class yes so there was a slow transformation in the power relationship between the people on the one hand and the king and the the warrior community the king and the priestly classes on the other now and this this uh, gradual transformation into this kind of power situation took place through the symbolism of the religious sacrifices ma'am we do have lot of references about the concept and nature of kingship yeah uh, you see kingship was actually a, a kind of an abstract notion to begin with the word rajan was actually uh, in the early days depicting a chief of the jana or the gana okay uh, and later on it got transcended into the position of a monarch now throughout this process of evolution we find that different kinds of qualities were attributed to the position of the king for example to begin with uh, the requirement for the leader to have uh, a kind of a heroic force to be a warrior and to be intelligent enough to win in a game of dice was the important criteria so that is why the the ideas of the divine divine, divine attributes of indra was associated with the position of the king but later on as uh, uh, sedentarism occurred and as there was an adoption of agricultural economy and there was kind of uh, a complex society emerging with social disputes emerging therefore there was a great greater requirement for uh, some kind of law and order to be established and the concept of the kings uh nature was now associated with the divine attribution of the god varuna who was said to be the divine judge among the gods so these are certain ideas this these which are generated through rituals and sacrifices for example we have num numerous references of the ashwamedha the vajapeya uh, and the rajaswa which were actually designed by the priestly classes in order to legitimize the authority of the king and in through these processes what had happened was that the, the divine attribution of the kingship was also getting attached to the idea of king so that at the by the end of the times we find that we shall have the concept of a powerful samraj or the powerful rajan or adhiraj and the concepts of adhipatya yes. over over the jana a demography as well as later on territory would, would evolve later on but first a demography that is a group of people mm -hmm. that was evolving now this is also associated and uh, we can reiterate back to the correlations the question that she had asked about the correlations between the archaeological complexes and the uh, vedic society 
uh, we see uh, the emergence of uh, village settlements in the OCP and the PGVR and the NBPW complexes in the upper Ganga Valley. This is the very time zone and the spatial zone which also witnessed uh, according to the descriptions in the Vedic uh, literature witnessed the rise of the Grama settlements of the Vedic people which would uh, probably lay the foundations of the later Janapadas and we shall have the state formation in the historic period, early historic period in the form of Mahajanapadas. <laughs>